Rich, welcome back to the podcast. It's so good to see you. Chris, thanks so much for having me back on. It's always a joy. Listen, I always appreciate my conversations with you because inevitably we get to one of my favorite places and that's the inner life. Um, and that is so central to our pursuit of wholeness. Everything we do and everything we are stems from the heart. So I want to start there, Rich. You know, since we've last talked, I think it's been several months at least, uh, a lot has happened in life and in culture. How's the state of your soul? What's going on? Like, Give us a biopsy. Yeah, you know, the state of my soul, uh, like many people over the last couple of years, has been uh, pretty weary. I, I mean, in some ways, I've had great rhythms, uh, a great network of friendships. Uh, yeah. I Thankfully, I'm in a culture, a church culture, that provides space for rest and refreshment and recreation. And yet, even with all of the gifts that I have because of the community that I'm a part of, it's still very tiring. I, I mean, uh, the on just from a social landscape, uh, the convergence of COVID, political idolatry, racial hostility, all of those forces there, I call it a CPR world, you know, that we're having a hard time breathing and our hearts are ailing. Besides that, just the regular task of parenting and marriage and uh, in my case, uh, writing a couple of books and speaking and pastoring, um, in many ways, uh, it's been pretty tiring, uh, and which makes me wonder, I can't imagine people who don't have a healthy ecosystem of rhythms and relationship. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine the state of their hearts because uh, my soul has been pretty tired. But all in all, um, we're in a good season right good, now, Rich. about to head on a nice vacation in all a right. couple of weeks. And I love it. Uh, all in all, we're doing well. That's so good to hear. You know, I just out of curiosity, do you sense when you wake up on a Monday or Tuesday, um, since pandemic really came into full blossom, uh, is there a greater sense of languishing? Like, does it take you longer to get started? Mm. Does it take you longer to get focused and motivated versus how it was three years ago? In my case, it has. In mm -hmm. my case, it has because the needs are unrelenting. Uh, um, as a pastor, yeah. in particular, I'll just talk about my my vocation and yeah, you know, there are moments because of how divisive and polarized our society is. I don't always know what I'm walking into when I get into a meeting. And so when someone says, "Hey, Pastor Rich, can we have a conversation? Hey, Pastor Rich, can we meet up for coffee?" In some ways, I'm already on edge, like, oh, no, what's what's going to happen now? And so in some ways, uh, I don't know if that has been part of my pastoral call or, or sense prior to the last few years. Uh, I've had certainly conflicts and hard conversations that needed to be had, but there's a level of unpredictability in the last couple of years that I think has made it more difficult to get going. So, yeah, I, I think... Waking up in the morning, there are good days, and then there are not so good days. Uh, and I think I've noticed that trend, especially in the last couple of years. Do you find yourself as a husband, father, leader, mm, involuntarily being on guard a little more? It, you know, like for the person that says, hey, Rich, can we meet? Can we talk? Do you feel mm -hmm. like your, your guard goes up quicker than it maybe has been at any point in life just because of how we've been cultured by living every day in the world. What Without question. Yeah. And I, I think I have experienced that. Again, it began when the pandemic hit mm -hmm. and we started making decisions about when we're going to gather, when we're not going to gather. And then very immediately, these issues be, uh, became very polar, uh, politicized. Yeah. And once things get politicized on that level, yeah. a gargantuan national global level, um, that stuff hits our communities mm -hmm. uh, in, in very profound ways. And so my guard, absolutely, I, it's one of the things that I've had to be really mindful of as a leader. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm on guard right now, which, uh, you know, someone uh, a couple of weeks ago said, hey, uh, Rich, can we meet for uh, an hour? I'm, I'm noticing certain things and I just wanted to process huh. and I'm going, oh, no. And so uh, yeah. I, I responded by saying, and this has just been one of my practices, can you just give me a brief summary of what you want to chat about so, um, so that I am just as I want to be as present uh -huh. 
it's not that I want to just have my talking points outlined and then I can just go according to a particular script. For me, the, the motivation is I want to be as present with you as I possibly can. That's good. And so if I'm carrying a sense of anxiety about what I'm, I'm mind reading, I'm living according to assumptions, because whenever people say, can I meet with you? My first thought is, okay, what did I preach? What did I post on social media? Is there a decision that I made? Mm -hmm. My mind goes all over the place instead of me going, can you just give me a brief summary? And the person said, I am just so burdened mm -hmm. that the friends that I've seen over the years, I haven't seen them come back. And I just wanted to talk about it. And I just thought, yeah, sounds like a great conversation mm -hmm. to have. And I was truly pastorally present, but my guard sadly, you know, is up. So I have to work really hard to mm -hmm. make sure that it doesn't become a barrier to mm -hmm. actual connection with others. Had you not asked that person for that primer before, you know, before the conversation, what do you think your self-talk would have been like? Here's what it would have happened. And the reason why I know is because I've experienced it. So this is not me talking in abstract ways. This is me. What, I'll tell you what would have happened. I would have had countless moments in a given day when I would be reminded, oh, I'm going to meet with this person. And then my mind, again, is jogging what I've said. What have I said? Or living according to particular assumptions that I think that person might be holding. And then all kinds of judgment. At New Life, we talk about there's a particular skill that we teach called stop mind reading. Stop mind reading. And it is a way of not living according to assumptions. And so what we often say when, we, when we're carrying an assumption about someone, about what someone might think or how they feel about us, I'll go to a particular staff person. Hey, so-and-so, hey, could I have permission to read your mind? I think that you think X, Y, Z. And then I go, is that true? And they go, no, that's not true. And I go, oh, you know, I've been carrying this for just a while. I just wanted to clarify that. Or they might say, yeah, that is true. And I'm able to go, well, I just want to process it. Instead of me living in what happens is judgmentalism of others, living according to lies and faulty thinking. So in the past, I would have been thinking about it nonstop. I think it would have impacted my sleep, impacted my relationship with that person because there are times when it's going to take two to three weeks before I meet with that person. And then every time I see them, I already have a particular, ah, oh, what's this person want to talk about? So I can't truly love them well or be present to them. So that little question, getting me a quick summary of what you want to talk about, at least helps me live in reality and not in assumptions. How do you train yourself? How do you train your character in a way that when the train of anxiety is rolling, you're saying, Rich, pause, I've got to approach this person to say, hey, I'm not going to pretend I'm going to read your mind in this moment. What's this about? That's a discipline and a skill. How do you do it? You, I, I think part of it, uh, there's there's formative practices and then there's frameworks. Yeah. And by frameworks, I just think about theological frameworks. I think of just sociological frameworks, psychological frameworks. Uh, and so in terms of just the reactivity or just uh, being present there, uh, I have to, in my mind, understand that something like anxiety is a, a normal human response. Uh, and so because it's a normal human response, I want to now investigate my anxiety. Uh, most people believe that to be anxious is either a sin, number one, or to be anxious is a sign that I don't trust in God, or to be anxious is something that is to be um, suppressed by any means necessary as opposed to anxiety becoming an opportunity for my own compassionate self-confrontation. Uh, and so whenever uh, I, I have already in my theological and psychological kind of toolbox know that this is to be human is to be anxious, to be human is to recognize that I'm going to have disproportionate feelings and responses or reactions to what people say. But now out of that place, how can I be aware of that and not allow that to drive my behavior. And that's the most important thing about driving it. To be human is to, to be anxious is to be human, but to be driven by that is to now participate in something that God really doesn't have mm. for us or, or, or desire for us. And so, you know, anxiety is this automatic reaction to a real or perceived threat. That is really at the core of it. It's a life that's marked by reactivity. It's a life that's marked by emotionality. And I just have to be aware of that. So much of it is just self-awareness. 
And then when these moments come, here's really what I'm trying to do. Number one, I'm trying to self-regulate. I'm trying to pay attention to my breathing. I'm trying to get outside of myself, which is why journaling and offering, writing out my words helps me to look at myself as it were outside of myself. When I read words on a page, I'm able to go, oh, that's, that's what I'm thinking. This is what I'm believing. And I have a little bit more objectivity uh, to my life. Additionally, I need community. Uh, Chris, just yesterday, I had a conversation with uh, three friends that I meet with just about the first two, uh, Wednesday of each month. And in those meetings, we're talking about our anxieties, our disproportionate reactions to things. And I just need other people's perspective to help me get out of my own reactivity. And so those are some of the things that I've, I've built in. And I do not do this perfectly, Chris, but I think it has helped me along the way to manage it much more effectively. I love that, Rich, and that's so helpful. But the first thing I heard you say is awareness. What What yeah. are some of the trust structures of be, being more aware in your life, cultivating awareness? You know, I, I don't know if it can happen without a regular call to prayerful self-examination. And, um, and here's the problem that we live in. We, we live in a world in which we are driven by a chaotic rhythm and by compartmentalization. And what I mean by that is, by chaotic rhythm, there's just a pace of life that does not make it easy to actually step back and observe myself. That's number one. Number two, by compartmentalization, there are aspects of my humanity that in the name of Jesus, I can often uh, suppress. And so uh, three things in particular, when I think about the anger that we feel, when I think about the grief that we carry, when I think about the anxiety that courses through our bodies, it's often those three things in many church contexts that people are not given the freedom to actually entertain those things because supposedly, those things are not feelings that God is pleased with. And so as a good Christian, I shouldn't be angry. As a good Christian, I shouldn't be anxious. As a good Christian, I shouldn't feel grief. As opposed to as a human being, I'm going to feel these things. And how can I now invite God into those spaces and unashamedly begin to articulate actually what's happening in my soul? So good. And so I, I don't know if that comes without those tools of reframing theology, reframing our mm -hmm. humanity, reframing how we look mm -hmm. at the scriptures, and then thinking about the pace of, of life that we're living. I'll give you Please. an example, Chris. Today, it's been a, a, a pretty um, frenetic week mm -hmm. for my family. And I'll tell you what's going on. On Sunday, this coming Sunday, we have about 35 uh, people all over our home, middle school families. Uh, for connection, I want to connect with parents of middle school. Mm -hmm. I have a 13-year-old. And so we just want to create a mm -hmm. hospitable space for them. Now, in order to prepare for something like that, I mean, the house has to be in order. We're, we're making sure we have food. We're going all over the place. In addition to that, I got to get mosquito repellent <laughs> for our backyard yes. because the mosquitoes are going crazy back here. And then I realize, oh, I have a sermon to prepare mm -hmm. this Sunday. There's a lot that's going on. And just earlier today, I just found it in my body. Like oh. I'm tense. I'm feeling I'm, I'm short with my children. Uh, and I just know sometime today, I better get space, 30 minutes to open up my journal, spend time in prayer and really go, what is going on? I know there's something about my frenetic pace right now, but there's something else going on inside of me that is driving this and i better get to jesus today or tomorrow in order to allow him to speak into my life there so this is an ongoing thing for me and i'm feeling it even okay today. you opened up an important can listening to your body Th that's <laughs> not a space a lot of people traipse in unpack that a little bit what does that mean how do you do it and i'll even just ask this rich why is it so important because i believe it is I think number one, let me start mm -hmm. with why it's so important. It's so important because we live in embodied faith. We follow a God who has become embodied. 
wow, we follow a God, John 1, 14, the word becomes flesh. The word takes on a body. And what I love about that is uh, Jesus doesn't just take on a body and then says, this was great while it lasted. I'm going to go back into spirit form. And this was just a temporary tent, a temporary structure to accomplish my salvific purposes. And now I'm back to this immaterial reality. That's not what Christianity teaches. Christianity teaches that Jesus Christ rose from the dead bodily and that he resurrects in a glorified state, but it's a glorified bodily state. And so in the coming of Jesus, the body is sanctified. There is a, there is a greater, even a greater, you can argue from the Hebrew scriptures, there was already a great emphasis on the need to pay attention to our bodies, even more so with the incarnation and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, number one, Christian faith teaches that our bodies matter. Now, over the years, what has happened, and this is from the very beginning of the church, the church has been influenced by particular teachers informed by Platonism, Gnosticism, Manichaeanism, that has said the body is bad, the spirit is good. And the body is a prison for the spirit. So we have to now you know, deny the body so that we can release the spirit. We've seen many iterations of that over the centuries. And so what has happened is there's this two-tiered approach to life. Spirit is up here, body's down here. As opposed to Jesus came not just to save our spirits, but to save our bodies. He came to save our entire beings. And so that's kind of the theological kind of background here. Uh, what does this mean, though? I think it means that our bodies have a lot to teach us because our bodies, the way we are created, our bodies often implicitly know what it takes our minds and our consciousness uh, often days to discover, weeks to discover, years to discover. And so because of our embodiedness, I, my body often knows, we say at New Life, you know, our bodies are a major prophet, not a minor prophet. Our bodies speak loudly. And so whenever I get an eye twitch whenever I can't catch a satisfying breath, whenever I start breaking out in my, my hands and these like uh, dry skin or just these yeah. bumps on my fingers. It's yeah. often related to stress. It's often related to some yeah. anxiety underlining. And for me, the body becomes now the check engine light. Mm -hmm. That's not just why we pay attention to it, but the body becomes a check engine light, letting me know that something else is going on. <laughs> Uh, in my soul. And so I want to pay attention to my, my body. And then secondly, why is it important is because I, I want to live with integration. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't want to live with mm -hmm. my soul flourishing and my body in a bad place. I, I want to live where there is this body, soul, spirit uh, integration uh, in which my whole life is being um, seen under mm -hmm. the Lordship of Jesus and not just some immaterial part of is, my life. Is that point the integrated life, why maybe a lot of the self-help industry misses. You know, if you canvas the bookshelves at, at any bookstore and look at the self-help section, they do talk about getting back into your body. A lot of the current wave is the nervous system. And I think all of that's really important. Yeah. But I see a lot of the industry approaching this one-dimensionally, very reductionistically. Why do you think, for all the information that's available, so many people approach even this subject so one-dimensionally rich. Is it because they don't have knowledge of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Spirit, Soul, Body? What do you think? Yeah, you know, I, I do think that's part of it. I think that's a big part of it, actually, Chris. I, I think part, you know, I think of something, uh, this is actually in a book written by Thomas Merton. It came in, he wasn't the one who said it. It might have been um, Douglas Steer who said it, a Quaker author. Douglas Steer said that in prayer, we wait for a word that we cannot speak to ourselves. Now, when I hear that, I hear this is a critique against self-help. Because self-help, I'll just give one example of kind of mindfulness or uh, self-affirmations. Um, it's often rooted in that. I must affirm myself. And I, listen, and I think we'll find that in the Psalms as well. Encourage yourself, you, you know. I'm talking to my soul. Be encouraged. So I think there is space for self-talk and space for self-affirmation. But as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, I believe that 
there is a word that must come from outside of me. I was made to live in the love and in the affirmation of something outside of me, of a power outside of me, of a love outside of me, of a presence outside of me, of a God outside of me. And I think that is, in my estimation, as a pastor, as someone who spends time in theology, the soul, our, in, our, ourselves, our, in, our identities, need something outside of ourselves that we cannot speak to ourselves. And so that word by Douglas Steer, kind of in prayer, we wait for a word that we cannot speak to ourselves. There is something we need that we cannot deliver to ourselves. And I think that comes ultimately in the love and in the voice of the Father. Where does that quote come from? Us. Is that from a book that he wrote or a talk? I, I want to dive deeper into that because that hits the target on something I'm just really feeling <laughs> right now. It might have been, and I can follow up with you on this, it might have been a book called Contemplative Prayer by Thomas Merton. And it was the introduction. So it wasn't Merton, but it was, I think. Oh, yeah. Here, and but I can, you I know, can I'll do some research, too. And folks, I'll, I'll throw that in the show notes because that's huge, yeah. Rich. And, and this is why I ask. And, you know, I maybe I'm on a little bit of a soapbox these days, but because I'm so passionate about wholeness and integration and people really experiencing freedom yeah. um, from this languishing and the deep systemic anxiety. Um, you know, I, I canvas Barna stats a lot, Pew Research stats a lot, and there's this trend downward and away from faith, especially in younger generations. Now listen, caveat, huge asterisk, which I believe in Gen Z with my whole heart. I think they're gonna change the world in a beautiful way. Now, having yeah. said that, this is just the data. Based upon what you just said and what we've just said around self-help, why do you think so many are becoming just syncretic in their faith journey? In other words, it's not Jesus or, it's Jesus and. And the and is benign spirituality. Um, I mean, for lack of a better word, I call it Christian Buddhism. Mm -hmm. um, it's where, as you said, meditation mm -hmm. is in place, mindfulness, but it has nothing to do with the kingdom. It has nothing to do with being poor in spirit, as Jesus talked about in Matthew 5. And I know, Rich, this is a... A huge question that has uh, broad implications, but I just would love to pick your, your brain because you are in a cultural me melting pot and you minister to people across many generations, and I'd love mm -hmm. your wisdom on the subject. I think I, I think I have a good response, Chris, for this, and uh, and and not just in my context in New York City. I think. Because over the last few years, I've had lots of conversations in person, online, with people who are deconstructing, with people who are trying to add on to things. Here's why I think you see that kind of syncretistic way of being. Christians have had, let me say, let me, let me preface it with, I'm a preacher, so let me start with an illustration here. My son loves chicken nuggets and french fries. I mean, he cannot get enough of chicken tenders and french fries. Now, we went to a nice restaurant last night. We thought, you know what? Let's go eat out tonight. We're going to have a good night. We went to a nice restaurant, and I'm looking at the menu. Plenty of delicious items there. And my eight-year-old son looks and goes, Daddy, are there chicken tenders and fries? That's all I want. And so I go... Of course, son. We'll make sure we get you the chicken tenders and fries. And so I'm eating this wonderful <laughs> shrimp pasta, just, del just delicious. And he's eating the chicken tenders and fries. Now we'll go to another restaurant. He wants chicken tenders and fries. And there's a feast before him. And he's so caught up in this one lane. And I think in the church, we often have chicken nuggets and French fries Christians. And what I mean by that is this. There is a feast of something called church history. There is a feast of something called the global church. There's a feast of something called the church in t beyond time and space that Christians for the most part have not opened themselves up to. And so when you think about something like mindfulness, for example, you know, Christians have been doing this for 2000 plus years. And we come from a tradition that's been doing this thousands of years before that. And so it's often that Christians have been so formed within their own myopic, narrow tradition that they don't know that there's a feast outside of their own church experience. 
the greatest gift that I've received in my discipleship. I'm 43 years old, became a Christian at 19. I've been a Christian for 24 years. The first five years of my Christian faith, I was exposed by God's grace and by godly mentors to the global historic church. So I was reading upon things that were, East, uh, you know, um, uh, Christianity out of Egypt and the Eastern Orthodox emphases of Christian faith that are rooted in Jesus, that are rooted in practices. And so I think because we have so limited, part of it is often Christians believe that the church started at the Protestant Reformation. And so that's where the, the church began, you know, that the Holy Spirit came during the uh, Protestant Reformation. Yeah. Uh, but the Holy Spirit came before the Protestant Reformation. So I think there's that. And I don't think we've opened ourselves up to uh, Christian teaching beyond, you know, across time and space. Now, that's not to say that we can't learn anything from other religions. I think wherever there's truth, God is to be found. But I think the Christian faith and all of its beautiful expressions, uh, there's, there's a feast before us, but so many Christians have not opened themselves up to that feast. And so I think in a, in a reactionary way, they start going to Buddhism. They start going to other uh, secular ideologies of self-help when in fact our tradition and our faith offers us much if we look beyond just our own city, our own state, our own country. Does that key begin to turn the lock on the door, so to speak, with understanding even the function of prayer? And, I, and I'm thinking about this through the lens of your new book. Um, you spend a lot of time on that. And I'll just quote you, Rich, and we can go yeah. here and, and you can take this wherever you feel would be helpful. But you wrote in the book this quote, to talk meaningfully about wholeness. And folks, if this is really the agenda of uh, this conversation today, really getting to a place of transformation and wholeness, Richie said to talk meaningfully about wholeness and love begins with a reappraisal of our prayer, because in so doing, we will be taking stock of what our souls deeply long for. Okay, so connect the longing of the soul, Rich, to the reappraisal of prayer. What's at stake? Here's the thing. I think prayer, the reappraisal of prayer is necessary because prayer too often lives in the land of transactionalism and not in communion. We were made for communion with God. We were made for presence with God. We were made to be present to the presence. We were made to be with being. We were made to uh, receive the affirmation of the Father, to cultivate uh, friendship with the Holy Spirit, to draw into intimacy and move into intimacy with Jesus. That's what we were made for, communion with God, being with God, out of that place where our souls are deeply tethered and connected to God. And that often happens in stillness, that often happens in solitude, that often happens when we are actually quiet and still enough, Psalm 4610, to know that God is God. Now, what has often happened and this is something that's happened not just last year. This is something that's happened over the, over the years, over the decades, over millennia. Prayer very easily becomes a means to get what I want. And so prayer becomes now transactional. I say particular words with a particular level of intensity. I do my part and God now does God's part. And uh, I always have to say that I am for petitionary prayer. I'm for intercession. I mean, I do it every day. Uh, but if we're leading with that, if we're leading with this is what I need, if we're leading with this is what I need God to accomplish for me, as opposed to I need God to do something in me, um, we're going to miss out on the essence of prayer, which is why I think Jesus, when he teaches us how to pray, he has us pray our Father first. He doesn't have us pray, give us this day our day our daily bread, our father. He says, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And so I think what's the reappraisal of prayer is we, we have to think about prayer as communion. And why is this important, Chris? Because I think as we offer ourselves to God, we now allow the Holy Spirit to form us into people who can be present with others. And that's the reason why we need a reappraisal of prayer for this particular moment in which mm. we don't know how to be present with one another. We don't know how to listen to one another. 
We don't know how to weep and lament with each other. We don't know how to be curious with one another. What do we need? We, we need a radical change in how we even function. And I think prayer, when done in this way, gives us some of the most important resources to actually practice that in our world. So what then makes prayer effective? I think about James, James chapter five, he says the fervent and effectual prayer of a righteous person makes tremendous power available. And I don't want to insinuate, as you were saying, like this is just pulling the slot machine on a vending machine named God. I, power is made available, yes, to change circumstances, yes, to move mountains, but power is available to change us. What makes prayer effective, Rich? Well, I think what happens in prayer is we are in many ways led into reality. Uh, when we open ourselves up to God uh, in reflection, in confession, in solitude and silence, we create space for God to actually begin to address us in ways that we need addressing. God begins to address us the things that we need to repent of the, the attachments that we have built our entire identity on. Uh, give you an example. I'm, let me just talk in real time. I don't, I don't want to just talk in theory. I want to talk in how I'm, how I'm, you I know, so appreciate that. I can't, this book came out, Chris, and this is my second book. Yeah. And my first book did fairly well. Now, as my second book is coming out, I'm thinking, wow, this book should do a whole lot better than the first book. And so uh, I'm just waiting for it to be a whole lot better. Now, it's off to a great start. Uh, but even so, uh, at this point, I'm thinking this should have been way more impact than what I've experienced so far. Now, that's what's in my brain. Now, when I get to God in prayer mm. and I sit and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to me and just be with God and I take out my journal, here's what comes to the surface. Rich, why are you so attached to this? Rich, why are you so, why are you building so much of your sense of self and identity on your Amazon rankings? Rich, why are you uh, feeling good when you get praise and you're just so downcasted when criticism comes your way? Now, what happens in prayer is I now live in reality and reality is where God changes us. The only place that God doesn't dwell is in illusion. And if my life is marked by illusion and refusal to embrace reality, what, what happens? I now, in some ways, and this is terrifying to say, I now cut God off in some yeah, ways Rich. Yeah. from some aspect yeah. of my life. And that's terrifying to say because God, God does not dwell in illusion and in lies. Mm -hmm. God dwells in reality and in truth. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that's what's at stake here. And that's what has helped me, which is why I need a life of prayer, because if not, I will be sucked into my own vortex of um, needing to be something, needing to accomplish something, needing to prove, needing to possess, needing to protect something as opposed to living out of the center of the love of God. Now, Rich, you are painting such a stunning picture for us, for the listeners, because if we all are faced with the opportunity to choose truth over lies, and we don't have a, rob a robust prayer life, we're going to be apt to believe a lie. And uh, I'd love to even connect what you just said, your identity, and the statement about like, God, God won't work with us, work in us, according to an illusion, but who we are. In fact, I've heard it said this way, Rich. I'm going to probably botch the quote, but whatever. Um, God can't bless who we pretend to be. And uh, let's just connect that thought. Every good lie contains a measure of truth. But how do we discern yeah. a lie from truth? And then what do you do to replace that lie with truth? And I think prayer is connected. Yeah, a couple of things come to mind. Um, I do believe whenever, uh, even whenever someone says something about a criticism, within every criticism, there's truth to, uh, and so I need to be open to that. Um, I'll mention one thing here. I think one of the ways that we can tell the difference is when it's, it's all or nothing. So all or nothing language, always language, give an example. Um, 
you know, as, as a pastor, there are often these messages, these often deceptive brain messages that are in my lodged in my soul, lodged in my psyche that, uh, leads me to live in ways that I, I think, you know, carrying shame and self-condemnation. And one of the messages that I have identified is uh, when I bring up delicate issues, that means I'm causing division. Now, I remember me addressing some very difficult things in our congregation in light of what was happening nationally. And that became a message that I was believing. Because I'm bringing up delicate issues, I'm causing division. Now, I think, I think ultimately that's a lie because bringing up delicate issues is not the reason why people divide over stuff. Now, how we bring it up, the timing we bring it up, the means in which we bring it up, now that's another story. And so I've had to uh, think about this in my own way. To bring up delicate issues doesn't mean I'm causing division, but it, is there some truth in that the way I've been bringing some things up has actually been contributing to more division than I've hoped. And where can I now pay attention and engage? And again, that phrase for me is compassionate self-confrontation, where I can now look at myself in ways that are not driven by self-condemnation, but I want to live in truth and humility and repentance. Um, and so I think that's one of the ways. The, the other thing is, I, I know I'm living in lies when it gets to a point where I'm now moving away from God. That's really the essence of lies. The essence of lies from the evil one. When the evil one speaks lies, you know, it's for the purpose of pulling me away from God. Uh, and so I think for me, that's when we're in a dangerous point. Now, I can hear the truth and it might be very difficult and it moves me to God. But that's a couple of ways, Chris, that I think about all or nothing kind of language and does it move me to God or does it move me away from God? Uh, those are a couple of ways that I think about it. Stay there on all or nothing because we do that in relationships. And I, you actually talked about relationships in the new book. And I love how you phrased kind of the three modes or three steps of, of relationships. Walk yeah. us through that, Rich, because um, – I think it's easy, especially in an incredibly polarized society where we're hooked to the 24-hour news cycle and on these devices all the time, staring at our phones you know, for hours a week, um, all or nothing is really potent and possible. Walk us yeah. through that inside yeah. of relationships. Yeah, the all or nothing happens in what I call these, these three phases of relationship. And by no means is this framework – original to me. What I've tried to do is uh, use some fresh language to get at uh, what I think is a sociological reality for us in terms of relationships. And I think about it often in, the, in when, when conflict emerges. Um, the three stages that I write about are what's called the heavenly stage, the hellish stage, and the holding detention stage. The heavenly stage is what happens when relationships are, are marked by idealism uh, romanticism, uh, when they're marked by, um, here's a strong word for it, idolatry. Uh, but let's just stay with idealism and romanticism for a second. I know all the new people at our church. Why? Because they are so complimentary. Uh, they think I'm the best pastor in the world. Uh, they have, you know, they, they talk glowingly about everyone. And whenever I hear the level <laughs> yeah. of like, what a church this is. I've never seen anything like this. I often go, how long have you been coming here? And they say, you know, I'm, I'm one month. And I go, well, uh, I'm so glad that's been your experience. But stick around a little bit because I don't want to, pre I want to present our church as perfect. Now, we have even a much more difficult maybe than most churches because my predecessor wrote a few books called Emotionally Healthy Church, yeah, he did. Uh, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, yeah. The Emotionally Healthy Leader. So many people come to our church because, oh, you're the emotionally healthy church. And so there's this idealized vision of what that means. And then what inevitably happens is conflict happens. I say something from the pulpit in a way that maybe wasn't as nuanced, maybe wasn't as tender, 
um, maybe wasn't as comprehensive and someone hears it and they're triggered, they, they have a, a, a reaction to it and they go, I thought this was the emotionally healthy church. Or they have a meeting and they catch me or one of our leaders on a bad day and, and they go, I thought that. And so what happens is the pendulum swings from heavenly to hellish. And it is at this stage where we're no longer angels. People are demons now. This is no longer heaven. This is hell. And now this is my opportunity to get the hell out of here. That's what happens. <laughs> and so, uh, and so that, that's what happens in relationships. Yeah. And so, so true. romantic relationships, careers, church experiences, once that pendulum swings and we go, oh, wait a minute, you, you mean to tell me you're not perfect or I'm out of here, as opposed to what does it mean to hold the tensions? Now, Chris, this is very real to me. Just uh, day before yesterday, I had a very challenging conversation with a congregant. Uh, I had made a decision that was rushed. Now, I do think the decision was correct. Uh, and I got feedback from some of our staff who said, yeah, Rich, I think that decision is correct. But what I did incorrectly was the pace of the decision. I rushed it. I, could, I should have waited and done it a little bit more deliberately, but I just kind of made a quick decision. Well, I had a follow-up conversation. And uh, part of the conversation was the shock that... Is this how the emotionally healthy church operates? Is this how the deeply formed life operates and all that? And I had to let the person know, uh, by no means are we a perfect church and by no means am I a perfect pastor. What I had to do there is model forgiveness and humility and all the rest there. But what happens is easy because we don't have language for flesh and blood communities and relationships The all or nothing becomes the exact, the, the, the framework through which we see everything. How do you not become defensive in moments like that, Rich? Because in that all or nothing culture, I mean, yes. it's like our proverbial yes. fists and our proverbial shields are up. We're ready to protect and fight. You know, it's back to theological frameworks that I, and I try to wrestle with in biblical frameworks. You know, in, in the second book that I just wrote, I have a chapter on humility and I say that humility at its core is poverty of spirit. That's what, that's, that's what Jesus says, radical dependence. Uh, to, to be humble is you know, to be of the earth, to be low, hummus. It comes where we get the word hummus from. Uh, to be of the ground, low. And at its core, humility means that I live a life in which there's nothing to prove, nothing to protect, nothing to possess. That's the humble life. That's the life that moves beyond defensiveness. Now, I still get very defensive about things, but here's what, here's what I've learned. Here's how, this is how I've grown. Uh, I'm happy to share about my, I have plenty of failures, Chris, and I have lots of areas of growth. I have grown, but in, in the last few years, this sounds really arrogant, Chris. I hope it doesn't come across this way in terms of humility. <laughs> but I, I want to say it in, in terms of nothing to protect, nothing to possess, nothing to prove. Because I, I, have, I have not lived according to an idealized vision of myself. At one point in my life, I had, I had such high standards for myself an idealized vision to, to, be, to be weak, to be broken, to be corrected, to be confronted means there's something wrong with me. For someone to say, hey, Rich, you did something wrong, I would be crushed by it. Why? Because I had such an idealized version of myself. You can call that pride. You can call that uh, whatever. But I think I'm learning to live with my humanity and learning to live with my mistakes, and learning to live. It was uh, a guy named Karl Rahner. He's a Catholic theologian. He, he said and that in many ways, our inconsistencies or our contradictions are a gift from God. And, um, and I think he's right, Chris. I think my, my contradictions... Now, that could be really abused, you know what I'm saying? But my contradictions, my inconsistencies, I think are a gift from God. 
because it reminds me over and over again, I am radically dependent upon God. And so when I had that conversation with this guy, and it was a great conversation, and I was able to say, listen, I want to ask your forgiveness, and I apologize. And I think, I th and I told him, I think my decision was right, but the pace of it wasn't. Um, but to live in that place, I think I, I have to live in the love of God, and I have to live outside of a idealized vision of who I am. I'm, I think that's the humble life, and I think that's something I'm I think I will have to grow in for the rest of my life. What's the lesson that we all can take away from what you shared? And thank you for sharing that, Rich. It's so generous of you to just be vulnerable in that way. What's the What's the takeaway lesson for us, though, about pace? Because I just think about um, all or nothing mm -hmm. communication, defensiveness, uh, decision-making, and then access to people's hearts in the context of relationship. Pace, yeah. pace is congruent with, rather in conjunction with, rapport and trust what should we learn yeah well in this case here i think it's a good case study i think our pace the the whenever we find ourselves at a frenetic pace and we're just making snap decisions uh without without giving thought to our ways and thinking about the implications of those decisions i think the lesson that we have to learn is this what is the underlying value and what is the underlying anxiety that is driving this pace? And so in my case here, the reason why I went so fast was because I had a particular value that some element of our church would have greater quality. Uh, there would be greater competence in this area. And so uh, that was kind of my, my, my value. My anxiety was, if I don't address this right now, I fear that we're going to lose momentum. I fear that I'm going to get unnecessary criticism. I fear that people are going to say, who's leading this thing? Why are we allowing this to happen this way? And that's my underlying anxiety. And so whenever we find ourselves making snap decisions, um, I think we, in order to step back and go, what's the value here? And what's the anxiety? that's tempting me to go at a pace and make decisions at a pace that are going to hurt people. Um, and as a pastor, the last thing I want to do is make the, I want to make decisions that are thoughtful. I want to make decisions that think through impl implications, long-term implications in the Bible. That's called prudence. That's a word that comes up in the book of Proverbs over and over again. And then at some point I have to make a decision, but I don't want to make a decision based on reactivity and anxiety. And I think that's what I got caught up in recently. So what I hear you saying is reactivity, anxiety, when we're being motivated from fear, we're living out of the false, out of the mm -hmm. false self, right? Absolutely. And our true self is who am I in God? My true self, if I could step back and go, my identity is rooted in the love of God. My sense of self is not based on what others think. Therefore, let me think through how can we make this decision in a way that's honoring in a way that's still thoughtful and holding on to my values, but in a way that doesn't rush the process. Now, in an evangelical, Pentecostal, Western American culture where leaders are, the best leaders are, are those who can do things like that. And that's really nice on the football field where you have to make snap judgments when someone's about to tackle you and you need to make, I can't do, I have to call an audible right now. And the level of my pace and my ability to make snap decisions and make adjustments are the hallmarks of good leadership. That works on the football field, but that's a bad thing for pastors and leaders in, in churches and in other businesses for that matter. Hmm. I want to stay just on the false self just for a moment more while we're in dissent in today's conversation, which has been so awesome. Rich, you said that our false self is a constructed identity that in some way tries to play God. And I, I want to swing back to what we were talking about regarding syncretism, because um, yeah. I think there is a possibility that those who are motivated toward syncretism, everything we talked about, secular wisdom, are living out of the false and a believed lie, even if they believe they're flourishing in life. Um, Oprah-isms yeah. are not going to change their lives. I'm just curious. As I said, Rich, I have such a passion for people and for freedom, but I'd love to know your thoughts on that. Do you think more people are li living out of the false and they don't know they are? 
well, my response comes out of my Christian biblical theological framework. Yeah. So I preface it by saying, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, my, our true self, this is Colossians 3, 3, I believe. Mm -hmm. Your life is hid with Christ in God. Your life is hid with Christ in God. Mm -hmm. Where is my true self? My true self is in Christ, mm -hmm. with Christ in God. Mm -hmm. So to the degree that I'm living out of that reality is the degree that I'm living according to my true self. You see, my true, my, my true self is not simply about the way that I express myself. My true self is much deeper than that. There's philosophically, there's this, there's this, there's this mm -hmm. ontological thing. It's about mm -hmm. essence, being. Mm -hmm. my, my very essence is rooted in Jesus. Mm -hmm. it's, I'm, my life is hid with Christ in God. That's the essence of it. And so as a Christian, I want people, Christians and non-Christians alike, to find their life in Christ. Mm -hmm. That's where our true self emerges from. So good, Rich. Not because I can make a decision to live my life this way or that way. Uh, that might be connected, uh, that, that may be adjacent to it or, or connected to it, but at the very core of my true self yeah. is who I am in God. Mm -hmm. And I say that as a Christian, I say that as a pastor, I say that as someone who loves scripture, that's the essence of my true self. That's so good. How do you, how do we refuse to protect uh, the false then? Well, I think, again, it goes back to our willingness to take inventory of our mm -hmm. own lives. Again, mm -hmm. the false self is this constructed, projected sense yeah. of self. And the false self is usually oriented around the affirmation and the approval of others. Yes. Uh, the false self is rooted in achievement. The false self is rooted in status. The false self is rooted mm -hmm. in uh, mm -hmm. belonging. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, again, and I say this, I, I say that there's there's some mysticism to this here, sure. Chris, and sure. that I believe that my life is hit because my life is hit with Christ in God. I live out of my true self in prayerful union with God, and that's where I make my decisions. But I think part of it emerges out of my ability to be curious with myself yeah. and ask, am I living out of the love of God? Or I think about Karl Barth, you know, Karl Barth, yeah. a great Swiss theologian of the 20th century, when someone said, can you summarize your, you know, 10,000 pages of theology yeah. that you've written, maybe more than that. He said, I can summarize my theology in one song. Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me yeah. so. And this, he said that. It's like, wow, how revelatory, you know? But I think what he's getting at is at the essence of who I am is who am I? I am loved by God. Uh -huh. And that is the only self, the only true self that is deep That's enough so good, Rich. to have me live in this world mm -hmm. in deep freedom. Anything else is not going to give me the kind of rootedness that my soul desperately mm. needs. Uh, and so I think it requires us to actually interrogate ourselves so in good. a way. I know that doesn't sound too compassionate, but I think in the best sense of that word, am I living out of, am I living yeah. out of my achievement? Is my identity rooted in my accomplishments and yeah. my status and who likes me and who is affirming me or is my identity rooted in the love mm. of God? Rich, I'm so thankful that you are helping to lead this conversation in our in our world today. It's so needed. And I mean, this brand new book, Good and Beautiful in Kind, number one, what a great title, but I'll just land this conversation here, Rich. Coming out of deeply formed life, what was the burn? What was the passion to say, I've got to continue this conversation in good and beautiful and kind? Yeah, you know, for deeply formed life, I was trying to give a in many ways, a, um, a comprehensive vision of what spiritual formation can be in this generation and holding together aspects of faith that often are compartmentalized and segmented. Um, so that was the vision behind the deeply formed life. Good and beautiful and kind, I'm going, okay, there are elements of the deeply formed life that need greater expression as we think about how we do life with one another. Uh, and you know, that title emerges from a poem from Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes wrote a title, a poem called tired in which he said, I am so tired of waiting. Aren't you for the world to become good and beautiful and kind. Let us take a knife and cut the world in two 
and see what worms are eating at the rind. And so for me, I'm trying to get at what are the forces behind our fractured lives individually and interpersonally and institutionally for that matter? And how do we identify those worms in such a way that leads us into greater wholeness? And as we think about the convergence of global pandemic, political uh, challenges, racial tensions, I think we need something like this more than ever. I totally agree. Rich, thank you so much for being here. And folks, wintoday.tv slash episode 304. There's a link in the show notes there. You can watch this conversation and get a copy of Rich's brand new book. But Rich, listen, we love you here on Win Today. I would love for people to just continue to stay connected to you. Tell them how to do that. You're a great follow on social. Uh, thanks, Chris. Three places, really, just richvelotis.com. That's you can hear about books that I'm writing and upcoming projects. Uh, you can also go on Twitter and Instagram to the handle is at Rich Velotis, And those are the places where I am trying to, I'm trying to encourage folks, practice ideas for sermons and articles and books and see, see the things that stick and are resonating in people and find that as an opportunity for me to build out, you know, build on some thoughts. And so those are the places you can usually find me. I think you're doing a great job, Rich. And again, just so thankful. Anything else before we land this plane? No, I'm just grateful, Chris, for this Thanks. conversation. And Thanks, my friend. We're in a very precarious time of life, and yeah. I think we're all longing for goodness and beauty and kindness. And That's so it. may the Lord lead us into those realities. Sound good. Thank you, Rich. Thank you.